Y'all, I am super excited about this week's episode because I am so intrigued with my guest as she shares her story on being an autopsy technician. So to my guest, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? All is well. I was just sharing with my guest today that this weekend is a self-care weekend. So I am going to be relaxing and not doing nothing. That's not, that's, not doing nothing is a blessing. <laughs> when when right? you can carve out the time to not do anything, it is a blessing. <laughs> exactly. So I was sharing with my guests earlier before we started the conversation. I was like, yo, I could not find anybody who wanted to come on and talk about their this topic. And I think I was, I think you're like the fourth or fifth person that I asked. And I was like, please, God, please. Why do you think that? Like, can you, can y'all not talk about certain things? Um, well, I mean, yes, obviously we can't get like specific with like cases and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. because you know, of course we deal with all kinds of things. So there might be like legalities involved, like cases that have to go to court and you don't want information out before it's right. To be so, I mean, which I, if you know how to navigate, you can. Yeah, because I'm not gonna be you, asking. You can give the tea without giving the tea. Right. <laughs> like, like, right. So. I'm like, I'm not gonna be asking about no cold case files. Like, I just want to know like <laughs> some general information. Yeah. So I'm. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's not like you have to sign an NDA or nothing, but they like don't be you know just putting all all kinds of business out there because you might get a obstruction of justice charge. Okay. <laughs> And we ain't trying to get no charges, child. No, none, none whatsoever. I am a law-abiding citizen, and I would like to stay that way. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, so before I begin, I have to ask this question. Okay. Do you like scary shit? It doesn't scare me. Um, like my ex-boyfriend, he's like was super in the he's super in the horror. Like we're still friends or whatever. And he would always want me to watch these horror. I'm like, these are dumb. This would not happen. This is not realistic. <laughs> like. Oh, well, you know, I guess you can look at it. I was like, this isn't entertaining for me because I'm just like, that's not how that would happen. But okay. Like, oh, because I'm like, I'm because I love scary shit. And I'm like, like, I like psychological thrillers, like stuff that messes with your mind, but like actual, like, gory horror movies. I'm like, this is silly. Like, did you like Dexter? Um, Dexter is a good show. I did. Yeah. Yeah, Dexter was fire. I don't like how they did my guy though in the season mm-hmm. finale of this new one. I don't like how he went out. <laughs> so I would say, in order for you to do this job, you would have to be comfortable with death. So when did you become so comfortable with it? Um, funny enough, uh, ch- like childhood death. Not, I was. I'm not. I've never been afraid of death. Mm-hmm. And I've been interested in forensics since I was like a little girl. I used to watch the X Files. And oh, I Agent, love the Agent Scully, she was not only she was an agent, she was also a, the forensic pathologist. Like she did the, the alien autopsies and stuff. And I just thought that was so cool. And then when CSI came along when I was in like middle school, I was like, this is awesome. Like this is some cool, this is cool shit. Right. <laughs> Wait, is forensic pathologist the same thing as an autopsy technician? So that's the medical examiner. That's their technical title, is a forensic okay. pathologist. Because you can be a clinical pathologist where you're just basically, which is pathology is the study of disease. So clinically, they're looking like if you are sick, but they don't know why you're sick, then you would probably be seen by a clinical pathologist to figure out, like House, he was a clinical pathologist. Right. So he kind of figure, diagnose you with whatever weird, obscure disease. And it's the same thing with a forensic pathologist. They're trying to determine cause and manner of death with how you passed away. Mm. I'm just curious now. Do you think the media does a good portrayal of the um the death care industry? Um yes and no. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's this thing called the CSI effect, which is difficult in my line of work because everybody thinks everything's solved in 20 minutes and they want answers right now, where it's like mm-hmm. it might take months, sometimes years to to do a deter- depending upon the type of case like with infant cases we do a battery of tests not just a physical autopsy we're sending the brain to our neuropathologist to see if there was anything wrong with the brain we're sending the heart to our cv pathologist to see if there was anything wrong with the heart so it's like you have to wait for all of these reports to come together in addition to the autopsy report to find out get a cause of death <laughs> like, right so, right so people want like 
No, five, like, okay, well, on TV, it's an hour with commercials, so it's like 45 minutes, and they know how they died, how long they had been there, all this, and it's like, it doesn't work like that in real life. Right. First of all, first of all, most offices don't even have the resources that these uh, TV offices have. Like, you look at CSI Miami, they got all kinds of equipment and uh, technology that you're like, right. we, wish, like we wish we had millions of dollars if not billions of dollars to get to run every test we can think of and have right. every piece of equipment. It's like most, I was like, we're st most of us are state or county agencies and we don't have, we don't have those kind of resources <laughs> to do. Yeah, that is things. true. Cause if somebody is watching all these shows and then they think it happens within a matter of minutes and then something yeah. goes on. So when you life. tell people, it can take eight to 12 weeks, eight to 12 weeks. I'm not, I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's, just how long it's gonna take right i was like and you have to understand your loved one isn't the only person that passed away <laughs> today let alone this week this month this year so there are like thousands of people dying every every year so right you have to, you have to fall in line somewhere you gotta unfortunately you have to wait your turn i know it's 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 rough it's hard because you're grieving, which makes you think irrationally, but you just have to be patient. <laughs> right. And I didn't know, well, I guess I did know this because people die every day, but the death care industry is very lucrative. When, um, not on my end, <laughs> but yeah, the funeral industry, yes, they, they are, they are making money hand over that. That is, that is a very lucrative industry. Well, you see why Phaedra was trying to open up that damn funeral home. Uh, yeah, like shoot, a casket alone will run you a couple grand, let alone you paying for the burial plot, you paying for the cosmetology, the, pre the prep of the body, transport of the body from wherever they passed away to, to the funeral. You pay it through the nose. <laughs> so wow. it, you pay, they, they get some good money. <laughs> Do you think you be you became desensitized to death? Yes, unfortunately, I will say. Mm. <laughs> I'm like okay, like when people like you know, my mother's my my grandfather just passed away last year um, due to COVID complications. Um, I mean that was of course like that crushed me, but you know people dying at church and you're like oh okay, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss, <laughs> you know, and then and then it, it's just like people die every day. <laughs> And I see dead people every day. <laughs> so right. I'm, just, I'm just not like, I feel bad. Mm -hmm. I try to be empathetic to people, but I'm like, yeah, oh, I, I'm sorry, but okay. Um, <laughs> ne next conversation. <laughs> you know what's so funny? Because I was having this conversation about like, I was so excited by having, um, about having you on a show. And the person I was talking to, they was like, I wonder how often do you look at the person as like my job opposed to oh this was a person well I try to be compartmentalized because if you look at these people as people while you're working with them you, you're you not gonna get anything done mm. <laughs> like, I just I promise especially in my office we are a high volume office because we're the only Emmy's office for the entire state mm. so we see everybody from every county every you know all over so we might have 20 cases a day. If I sit there and break down over all 20, I'm not going to get any any cases. I'm not going to get any work done. Right. <laughs> I'm going to get crying and, and carrying on. <laughs> mm. So what does an autopsy technician do? It, it all depends. Each agency is different. In my office, we're kind of a full service. So literally from pulling the cases out in the morning, out of the refrigerator to doing the radiology. So we are fortunate enough to have an X-ray machine as well as a CT scanner to scan cases on an as needed basis. We perform those tasks as well as we also do the photography of the deceased for um, like documenting injuries and if, as well as like ID photos. So if a person needs to be identified and their family is like looking for them, we can show them a photo. Mm -hmm. uh, of the deceased as well as cleaning them up undressing them cleaning them up as well as performing the actual evisceration of the autopsy which is the autopsy so that y incision you've seen in movies and television 
Mm-hmm. So, and, what type of oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, and what type of education do you need to become one? Um, in my office, you just need a high school diploma. You learn everything on the job. Oh wow! But some people do have bachelor's degrees, um, in a science, and some people do have mortuary science degrees as oh. well. But but you just need to be eighteen with a high school diploma. Oh wow! I would think that you would need more. No, because you learn. I, I learned everything at work. <laughs> Every. Oh wow! How was that experience? Just like just learning everything at work, like being hands on. It was it was really cool. Yeah. I, like I I it was very cool. It was very, you know, I, I'm trying to it was over it was overwhelming, but it was it was good. It was cool being able to get hands on and not just see or basically get completely perspective change from what you've seen on what I've seen on television as opposed and then physically doing it myself. Yeah. So I was I've learned, say- I've learned a lot. I was going to say, was you afraid of hurting them? But <laughs> I mean, no, like, honestly, when people first start, they're like very timid, myself included. You're like very timid. You're afraid you're going to like mess something up, cut something you're not supposed to. So you're like, you're, people like they're dead. You like, you can't. Right. It. It's, it's, it's okay. Like, you're like, but I don't want to mess it up. But they're like, you're not, you're not going to mess it up. It's fine. Just right. <laughs> you're going to be here. All, you're going to be here all day on this one case. If you don't um, get in there. Right. <laughs> And I also feel like you have to have like a certain type of personality to do this job as well, right? Um, I would say so, but I mean, I know people, whenever pe- I tell people what I do, they always are like, you, you're too pretty. You're, you too, you have too much personality. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not the corpse. I right. don't, like, <laughs> what do you, I'm like, what do you mean? Right. I'm like, I was like, what is what what do you think an autopsy assistant should look like? I, I would like to know. <laughs> right. Well, that leads to my next question on like what are the biggest misconceptions about autopsy technicians? I don't even think it's about autopsy technicians. It's like the office. They think you work in a basement, it's dark and it's dank. It's I was like, we have we have 16 autop we have 16 stations in our main area and then about three or four stations in our isolation area so Mm -hmm. you're never really by yourself in the room you can have 16 plus cases going at one time and we're all in there working together so Mm. people just always think like you're in a dark basement by yourself no (laughs) no not (laughs) like well that's in the that's because of what the media portrays yeah i was like i'm in a nice bright room we're listening to music or you know on the radio we're listening to uh like 92q or whatever which is like our radio one station Mm -hmm. it's i mean it's like any other office i guess (laughs) we're just (laughs) doing we're just doing autopsies instead of you know pushing paperwork right and how, how long have you been doing this it was nine years on the 14th Oh my God. Congratulations. Thank you. Does it feel like nine years? No, they flew when I say they flew by. <laughs> they they flew by. Oh <laughs> my God. So we have an expert, y'all. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't no regular regular entry level. Mm-mm, nope. Wow. I'm here so how were you introduced to this? I know you spoke about like the TV shows and stuff, but like what made you want to move forward with this this career? So initially I actually wanted to go to med school and become a pathologist, but I had a financial hardship during undergraduate school and had to withdraw. And my cousin, well, he's my mom's first cousin. He was the former police liaison's partner when they both worked um, homicide. Mm. And so he contacted the police liaison he got me an internship and then they at late like about 18 months later they asked me to apply for a job and that's how I actually got my job oh wow so walk us through a day okay so um we're on a staggered schedule so people start showing up around six Mm -hmm. so six seven and eight um are when the techs show up uh the six o'clock people usually um pull out the print the conference sheet which basically just has a list of the decedents for the day as well as some um information on how they 
passed away. Mm -hmm. So so we can kind of pinpoint what kind of cases, whether it may be a natural, a homicide, a suicide, or what have you. So we know kind of what to do because if it's a potential homicide or a suicide, like a self-inflicted GSW or something like that, then they would need an x-ray. Or sometimes we have um, people who are car accidents, but they like, you know, like their cars burst into flame and they're like completely charred. So they would need an x-ray because you don't know if something else happened prior to the car accident. Because I mean, we've had people shot and then they like, they're driving, they get shot and then their car burst into flames because mm. they, they crashed. So we start pulling out the cases. We x-ray whoever needs to be x-rayed. If anything needs to be CT, like usually infant or um, child, pediatric cases, they get um, a CT scan to see if there's um, anything internally going on prior to the autopsy. Uh, then everyone kind of, we have like an office, office personnel who sh will assign the cases to everybody. So they kind of start getting themselves organized and prepared to um, do the cases. Mm -hmm. Then around 8.30 is when our Emmys, they have their morning round so they can decide what cases they're doing for the day. Then they come down around 9, 9.30 and we get started. So as far as getting started, they'll do their external examination. Like they'll document whatever clothing the person is wearing, any medical therapy um, they have on. And then the tech will remove those items and clean them up for photos. And then the photographer will come in and do whatever photos are needed. Once that's done, once the full external examination is done, then the technician can proceed with the autopsy, whatever kind of autopsy it is. It might be a full autopsy, which is where you do the Y incision, you remove the chest plate. Um, in our office, we use um, the Black & Decker, like the hedge trimmers. Mm -hmm. Some people, to remove the chest plate, some people use a striker saw, which is like a circular um, saw we use for the removing the skull cap. But Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some people will use that. Like people who old, like old school, they'll take the striker saw and remove the chest plate. And then once the chest plate is removed, all the organs are exposed. So then the tech would get the serology fluids for toxicology. So that's urine, bile, if they still have their gallbladder, mm -hmm. some kind of peripheral blood, which would be subclavian, which comes, which is the subclavian is, are, is below the clavicle or the femoral artery, which is like in the, I like to say like the crease of the pelvis, like where your legs and your pelvis come together, mm -hmm. and your femoral artery is located. So you'll get blood from that area and heart blood mm. if they had any so once you remove once you get all your serology fluids oh and vitreous which is the clear fluid in the eyes so yes yeah, you get a needle in the eye if you, <laughs> if you get an autopsy so once that's done then we'll start uh removing the organs in my office we do on block which means you take everything in one a whole thing so from the tongue to your rectum and with the man, the prostate, the woman, the ovaries, and uh, sometimes part of the vagina. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with the over the organs? Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I usually will free the tongue first because it's the hardest part to get because you don't want to you don't want to puncture a hole in someone's neck. Funeral homes don't like that because then you you wonder why somebody got on a turtleneck and it's July because <laughs> probably because somebody messed their neck up when they was either when either when they were embalming them for and prepping them for their services or if they had an autopsy and the, the technician uh there was a hole in the, put in the neck and they couldn't repair it well enough to have the neck exposed at services then i'll free, free the bladder and then i'll go and you just go along you kind of cut along the aorta so once you cut along the aorta everything will pretty much come out you just disconnect all the connective tissue including the diaphragm so your liver, so your liver, your kidneys, your spleen, your pancreas, your small intestine, your large intestine, everything will just come out in one swoop by the tongue. Wow. And you, lay it, and you put it on the cutting board for the doctor so they can dissect the um, the organs. They save a piece for stock. Sometimes they'll take micros to make slides if um, potentially a lot of times they'll do that if it may potentially be a drug overdose, but if it comes back that your tox is negative and they need some something else to look at, they'll do slides so they can see if there were anything wrong with the organs that they couldn't see um, with the naked eye. It might be something microscopic that mm. they can see. 
to determine cause and to determine your cause of death. Child, I know you can do an autopsy in your sleep. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then so after you remove the organs, then you go on smooth to remove the brain. So you go from ear to ear. I like to lift the chin so I can kind of see how your head's gonna lay on the pillow. So because you don't want to cut too low, you don't want to cut too high. And then you reflect the scalp. So basically you're pulling the back of your the person's head over their forehead. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> it is. And then you're doing the same with the, the nape of the neck. You're pulling that down to like the top of the shoulder. So then you have these two muscles on the side of your head called your temporalis muscles. They just provide some cushion if you like have a head injury so you're not just hitting your, your skull directly. So you have some cushion. You reflect those down. Then you take the saw and, <laughs> and saw around to pull off your skull cap. Then your brain is exposed. And so what then, does the brain look like in person? Like they get it right and horrible. It's it's spongy and it's wrinkly. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are firm and some of them are like squishy or falling apart. <laughs> um, so then you have this um you have the dura mater, which protects mm -hmm. your brain. It's another like kind of muscle for cushion. So your brain isn't like, if you do hit your head, your brain isn't just hitting your skull directly. It has something to protect it so you don't uh, <laughs> you don't crush your brain. So once you free that, you disconnect the ocular nerve, you free the dura on each side of the brain and you disconnect the brain stem. And then you take the brain out and then they weigh it, dissect it, save pieces for stock. And then once all that is done, <laughs> You take the viscera bag, which has all the organ pieces in it, put it in the chest cavity, stitch it back closed, and zip the bag back up. Put the skull cap back, reflect your, take your forehead, take your scalp back, zip you up, and uh, send you on your way. How long does it take you to do an autopsy? Like, how many autopsies can, do you think you can do in an eight-hour shift? In an eight-hour shift, I probably, I think the most I've ever done was, like, nine Wow. I want to say. But not they weren't necessarily all full autopsy. Sometimes we'll do a partial autopsy where they just want right. a piece, they just want pops and a piece of liver and the brain, or they just want, or it's just an inspection where they just want to do an external examination and get tops. Or sometimes we do an what's called we call them, they call them peaks, but it's really like an exploratory. So it's an insight. So you open it up and they're like looking, depending upon what they're looking for, they might take a kidney. They might take a piece of liver. They might take this. <laughs> they might take that. But they're just checking to see what's going on internally. So, but yeah, um, what a, it depends on the circumstances of the case. But I want to say it takes me probably like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, here she go flexing, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> like just to remove the block and then maybe like another five to 10 minutes to get the brain. It doesn't, it, it really doesn't take long. Do you do um, autopsies on kids? Unfortunately, I hate I hate doing pediatric cases. I hate I hate them. Yeah, <laughs> like, how difficult is that? Especially infants. Oh my god, I'm just like you feel like now though. I'm like I still to this day feel like I'm messed those up. I'm like I don't want to hurt. I don't want to hurt the baby. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I hate them. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, do you do a lot on babies or? I personally, well, see, it's weird because we'll go like a long span with no like kids cases and then they'll, we'll get a season where it's like one or two a day for like two weeks <laughs> and then <laughs> there won't be any and then it'll, <laughs> yeah, so we get them in spurts. We don't really, not, it's not a consistent thing, especially like in the, like when the summer first breaks, you get a lot of big kids drowning and pools and stuff and you know, of course, like Sid's, Sid's babies and stuff like that. But like, they'll, when I say they'll, we'll go like months with none. And then it seemed like every day there's like three <laughs> for like a week and then there'll be no more. <laughs> so th thankfully they come in spurts. It's not like every day you're seeing a deceased child. When it comes to you or your team, like do, do certain people on team, like doing certain types of bodies, like maybe you'd be like, you know what? I don't want to do babies. And my, I know my coworker going to take care of that. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, everybody kind of touches on everything, but there are some people who are more comfortable and more seasoned with like kids cases or like burn victims. We have one tech who likes doing um, the isolation decomp cases. And we're like, you, you can have that because I don't like fooling with bugs and whatnot. So. Wait, what's the isolation decomp case? What is that? Decompose like people who are like bloated and like bugs and they're like in the water or or like people with communicable diseases will do in isolation just so everyone's not exposed to like tuberculosis or meningitis or hepatitis or HIV. Oh, uh, what do you like doing? I like doing homicide cases. <laughs> You gotta get to the bottom of it. I like, like, no, like, cause I mean, they're like very, I hate to say relaxing, but it's just like, you know, they're very methodical, especially when they're like bullet retreat, when they're projectile retrievals. I like, I like going on searching for, I like searching for bullets. I don't like, and seeing if I can find it before the doctor finds it or before like one of my coworkers, we call him the human metal detector because I swear he'll look at an x ray. And know exactly where it is. Like he'd be like, "Well, damn!" <laughs> so it's like, it's like I like to not have to call him over, <laughs> right? It's like I'm competitive. I don't, I, I don't mind asking for help, but I don't like asking for help. I want to do it myself. Yes, <laughs> right. How long he he's probably been doing it for a very long time. Then yeah, and he when I say he can just look at an X like <laughs> look at an X ray and be like, "It's in the back." It's in the back to the left. And sure enough, you'll turn them over, go to the back, slightly to the left, and it'll be right there. You'll be like, I've been looking for this thing for an hour, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Now, get away from me. <laughs> you, done pissed, you done pissed me off. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. Um, do you ever get backed up with doing autopsies? Um, Usually, no, we don't really have, I mean, we had a backlog like earlier this year, but that was an administrative, that was an administrative issue. We unfortunately try to do everything the day it comes in, which, and I say unfortunate because then the funeral directors, they become accustomed to and spoiled <laughs> to cases being done within a 24 hour time span. So then they're like rushing you and work. They done made arrangements. They ain't got the body. But they done made arrangements with the family said they can have that funeral on Thursday. Why did you tell them that? You don't have the body yet. Well, we just we just assumed y'all would y'all would have it. I'm like, and that, and more than likely that is true, but you never know. The doctor might put the case on hold for whatever reason, but it's to their discretion. Because technically mm -hmm. the body is under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner's office until we say it's not. <laughs> so you but, can't be decision. Wait, so how long can y'all keep a body? I mean, usually it might be like a day or two. Like say mm -hmm. it's a really bad homicide and they want to just like, we haven't found all, everybody was just like, you know what, we're tired. Our eyes going cross. My wound paths don't make any sense. Let me sleep on it and come back tomorrow with fresh eyes and try this again. Right. So maybe like a day or two, if they have a name. If they're unknown, it's until they're identified. Right. And with, you know, regular cases, it's usually like a couple of days for that but if somebody's like skeletonized or severely decomposed and you can't do fingerprints you might have to do dental you think you know who it is you've got these dental records so now you've got to do a dental ct or a dental x-ray to match so the we had forensic odontologists who come in so they can look at the control um dental x-ray and against our dental x-ray and say yes this is this person or sometimes we'll have to send like the femur bone to um, out for DNA testing. And that takes months to come back. Mm. So, but usually it's like a day or two. It's nothing mm. crazy, but it's like, don't tell them they can have, don't tell, it's Tuesday. Don't tell them they can have services on Wednesday. Child, and they want to get that money, baby. And, then, but I'm not, and I'm like, and I get it, but come on now. <laughs> Let, help me help you. <laughs> <laughs> they gonna be calling down here first. I'm like, well, I don't know why they made arrangements and they knew they didn't have your loved one. Right. So, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We are, we are working as fast as we can, but we are human, and things happen. <laughs> like, and right. I, you know. <laughs> have you ever seen something crazy inside of a body? Um, I almost got bitten by a live snake. 
that was in a body. Yeah. Girl. Yes, I did. Almost got bit by a live snake. How did the snake get inside the body? Okay, so this case was like, this was a couple of years ago. This guy was like, I don't know, there was a bad storm in like Pennsylvania. And I guess he couldn't shelter anywhere. Like he was, I guess, in a field or something. And so instead of like trying to shelter in place somewhere, he had nowhere to go. So he like wrapped himself around the tree. The tree got uprooted. It floated downstream. It ended up here. Somebody was on their property property foraging for mushrooms and found this saponified, muddy thing. They didn't know what it was. So they called the police. They airlifted it. it there was a person in there somewhere. <laughs> and they airlifted it to uh, our office, basically. And so I come into work. First of all, I was late. Like, I was super late that day. I don't even know why. Well, I don't remember why. I just remember I was really late. And so I get in, and I'm like, what? Like, what am I? What's my case assignment? What are, and everybody's, like, sniggling and giggling. And I'm like, okay. And so I go in the room, and it looked like a tree trunk in a rescue basket on an autopsy table. And I was just like, what is that? And they're like, it's your I'm like, there's a person in there? <laughs> like, okay, whatever. So I'm like, I don't even know what to do. I'm like, I don't even know what to do. I don't know. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I start cutting. So I turned and I'm working with uh, a fellow because we're a teaching facility. So we, we train future pathologists. So I'm working with a fellow and I had my back turned and I'm talking to him and he's like, snake. And I'm like, huh? And mind you, he's like, where was he from? Where was he? he was from Iran, which is neither here nor there, but he was just very like mellow, very monotone, very like didn't get excited. Right. He didn't sure get excited. He was just like, snake. And I was just like, huh? Snake. And I'm like, I know he's not saying snake. He can't be saying snake. Why would he be saying snake? But snake, I look, I see a tongue and a nose just darting at me out this thing, person's thigh. And I ran, when I say I ran, I'm like, I'm at working at a station that's like at the door. I ran to the back of the room. <laughs> I just ran. And mind you, we're like a teaching facility, like I said. And so we have tour groups from like cadet, police cadets and fire and all kinds of people. There's a whole tour group up there. And I was like, I don't give a damn about them. I'm not going over there until y'all get the snake. Cause I don't, I don't mess with snakes like that when they not, when they not in a cage. Oh my <laughs> like, God. And I, I would have lost my is. shit. I was like, I don't know what kind of snake it is. Is it poisonous? Is it not? I can't get bit in the behind and then go to the 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 hospital and they ain't got no anti venom because we in the we in Baltimore City, right? Well, like I can't. I was like, um, yeah. No, somebody go ahead and get the snake. If you want me to come back over there and finish what I'm doing, somebody gotta get it because I'm not I'm not going back over there until somebody get it. <laughs> Wait, so how did so how did he did the person die from like a snake bite or? No, they died. They just, de they died, they probably drowned, yeah. I want to say. And then they like decomposed. And so, you know, the little creatures and the little fish and all the stuff made a home in what was left and, or, and were snacking on what was left and snakes slithered itself on up in there and was chilling. And so I disturbed it by trying to do the autopsy. <laughs> and it was like 12 inch little brown and white. So I was like, but okay. Um, no. <laughs> like, yeah, like, no, thank God that thank God that your co worker gave you the heads up because, because, could you imagine? Yeah, and then we go look at the x ray, and you can see like this little they thought it was a shit, they were like, We thought that was a shadow, we had no idea there was actually. Oh my god, I would start crying. I would took off. I was like, I'm not going back. I mean, when I say I was freaking the fuck out, I was like, I'm not going back on that. So, I'm not, no. <laughs> I, no, <laughs> like, I'm not doing it. I don't oh care. My God. I, like, I don't care. I was like, y'all fire me right now because I'm not coming back over there <laughs> until y'all get the damn thing. Oh. <laughs> what would you say was one of the hardest days you encounter at work? Oh God, there's been a lot of those. <laughs> um, let's see. The hardest day I encounter. I don't know about hardest, but like one of the craziest days, we had somebody that had been like dismembered and they were like just on different tray tables. And it was just like, wait, what? Because the because all the pieces came in separately. Like it was like a, a gang situation and they like 
cut this person up and like scattered their body parts all over an apartment complex. And so they like finding, found an arm over here and a leg over there and the torso over here and the head over. And you just walk in and it's like four different tables with different parts of this person on the, you're like, oh, okay. This is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I had a case. I was like, I'll never watch CCTV because sometimes the detectives will bring in like the video, the surveillance video if it gets put on tape. And I watched the, we had like, there was this like guy that went on a shooting spree and shot a bunch of his coworkers. And you see two guys running for their lives. And I see the guy that I all times see like just get shot in the head. And I'm just like, oh, and then it just played on a loop. In my in my brain for like two weeks and I was like okay yeah never watching surveillance tape again yeah <laughs> and I feel like with you being in um Baltimore like I can only imagine the amount of homicide cases you deal with well we like I said we're we're I work for the state Emmy's office for the state of Maryland and we do the entire state we're the only Emmy's office in the state yeah. so it's not just Baltimore and then sometimes we end up with DC cases and sometimes we end up with Delaware cases. <laughs> if you're on the wrong side of 70, you you come in here instead of over there. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. What is the scariest thing you've seen a body do pre or pre or post exam? The bodies don't do anything i've never i don't yeah like do, i mean the gurgling the death gurgle that's not that's just gas being released but i've never had anyone sit up on me i've never had like but does that happen no <laughs> no it, i was like in the nine years i've been doing this i've never seen anyone just pop up now they might be sitting up when they come in because they're in full rider and they died like in a seated position and they're stiff but that's about it Oh my God. I might grab you, but not like grab, reach out and grab you. But like when you're moving them around because they're in full rider and they're like, hands are like, they might like grip you. I kind of got tugged a couple of times with my apron. I'm like, what is, I'm like, oh, okay. And you wasn't scared? Because I, I mean, the body didn't move. It just, his, their hand was like in this position. So I walked past and it like grabbed the loop of my, I was like, no, it yeah. happens every day. Girl, like, you walk past somebody slap your ass <laughs> what would you do it, I'm, it's happened so. <laughs> yo i would lose my shit <laughs> i mean <laughs> like i said you're not in a dark room by yourself so it's it don't not like, matter they reached out and touched like you know good and well somebody either rolled them over which has happened or you moved the arm out the way and it sprung back and hit you like you're just like whatever okay <laughs> oh my god <laughs> What's the most shocking thing you ever discovered while doing the autopsy? That snake. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But have you ever like found something like, like have you ever like found something that like solved the case or anything? Or maybe the other day I had a case and the guy had a tumor. He had a brain tumor. Mm. Mm. And the doctor, she made a joke. She was like, She's like, you should have did the head first. You could have had a cause of death and been done with this. So I was like, next time I'll give that a try. <laughs> wow. But can you see what a brain tumor look like? <laughs> I knew that one normal. I mean, I like, I went, I did, you know, and I was pulling the brain and I was like, that's not normal. Uh, that, she's like, here's a tumor. I was like, I, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> wow. In what ways have your job affected your mental health? Oh, it's a <laughs> um, I know. Well, now I know to take breaks. I have PTO. I take time off when it gets to be too much. We have right. personal days used as a uh, mental health days, so I take them because I mean it can be overwhelming. You're seeing death in all forms and fashions every day. <laughs> Yeah. that's not normal that's not normal <laughs> yeah do you go to therapy for it or um I probably should but I haven't started <laughs> I, I, do not. I mean it doesn't affect me in that way it's just like sometimes it's just depressing I'm like you know I just need a break I just right need to put, this on, put this on pause take a self-care day 
get my get my mom back together and we can try this again tomorrow. Because I was like, unless Jesus, like I like to say, unless Jesus chooses to walk the halls and wake them people up, they gonna still be dead whether I'm, whether they here today or tomorrow. Right. You know, I tell my office, I've told people in my office, this, I'm like, y'all are just in a hurry up and y'all just rush. What are we rushing for? I would like to know. <laughs> like, right. True. I'm like, I could get if we was like in the emergency room or, you know, <laughs> in a hospital, doctor's office, but they're deceased and they're going to be deceased. Yes, we okay. want answers. Yes, we want to get stuff done, but there's no need to rush. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> Take a break. Step back. Look at it with a fresh pair of eyes. Right. Right. It's it's going to be okay. Guess what? We are in control. And that's the that's the other thing. It's like, people are like, well, the police and the... I'm like, yeah, guess what? They they have to wait. Because cause we're, we're in charge right now. <laughs> like, 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 the body is under our jurisdiction, not the jurisdiction of the police. So right. they have to wait on this as well. Like, okay? Like, I get right. it. But like... <laughs> So how you do, do your you, job and let me be mad. That's, 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 you know. <laughs> well, how do you know, like, how do you get rates? Like, how do you know if you're doing your job well? Like, what do they measure it off of? Um, We have PEPs, but, I mean, uh, as long as you're not screwing up. <laughs> like, right. They'll tell you if you're screwing. You'll know if you're screwing up. Mm. They'll also if you're screwing up but I mean it's really not hard it's not a race take your time I had to build to being able to do an autopsy in 15 to 20 minutes <laughs> like right. in the beginning I was taking I might take 45 minutes to an hour take your time because guess what you can't fi- once you mess it up once you fuck it up you can't fix it right <laughs> you can't you can't can't fix it so you might as well take your time so you don't fuck it up right, <laughs> like, right. that's it's that simple but everybody's in a rush all the time you know I, it's just our society everyone's in a rush it's like take your time right i mean ain't nobody, they're not going nowhere right this is something you can't you can't if, once you mess it up it's messed up you can't you can't get another one it's not like you know dissecting a frog in anatomy in biology Right. They can't be like, oh, I messed up. Give me another frog. Nope, this is the only this person. <laughs> right, true. <laughs> Does this job make you question your religion? No. You know, I mean, everything happens in his divine time. Mm. We might not understand it, but we're not meant to understand it. <laughs> we just have to accept it. Right. Mm. I mean, it's sad, it's unfortunate, but in the grand scheme of things, obviously it's in it's it's in his plan. So right. I just I I let him I let I let God do his thing and I'm gonna do my thing. <laughs> right. And last but not least, can you see the relaxer on the skull of black women? I that, but I, no, you I, I in the 90s I've never no. Now you can see five. I've seen fibroids. I've seen matter of fact, I had a case a couple months ago. Fibroid was so big we thought it was a fetus. Like, yeah. Oh <laughs> like my God. I thought we I did the I was like, because then I was like, oh God, I'm ahead. I was like, please don't make me all have to this fetus. So I stepped away to do something. I came back and I was like, what? Was the, it was like it was a fibroid. I was like, it was a fibroid. And it, when I say it was, it looked like it looked like a fetus. Like her, the uterus was so swollen. Oh the woman my. looked pregnant. Yes, yeah, so I've seen I've seen fibroids, but actually, like seeing the relaxer on. The, no, I wonder if she knew she had fibroids. She had to know. So, yeah, I mean, as big as it was, I would hope she knew. But then you see people who are like carrying like fluid because their livers are, they have cirrhosis and their like bellies are, they, you see them people with them like hard, that like older, like especially like older men, but those like look, their bellies look like really hard. Usually they're full of fluid. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And you wonder how they were walking around with 3,500 cc's of cir- cirrhotic fluid in their abdomen. 
for this long because it's like it didn't just get like this it's been like this for a while oh my god but I bet this make you want to take better care of your health too because you like see all these different diseases and stuff yeah that's true or (laughs) now I mean I take as good I mean I haven't been sick in god knows how long like so I mean I take as good care of myself as I can but I mean some of these things are just, you have to understand that a lot, a lot of stuff is, yes, it's environment and it's how you take care of yourself, but a lot of stuff is also genetics. So it's like, you know, like, it's the luck of the draw sometimes. I know diabetes runs in my family. I, you know, there are some cancers that run in my family. I'm doing the best I can to not be end up in those situations, but if they happen, they happen. I'll just right. have to... Deal with deal with it as it comes, but I'm really healthy right now, and I take like I said, I'm I hardly ever get sick. Mm. I think the last time I was sick, bronchitis. So I mean, I don't even count that as being sick. sick. I have an asthma history. I have an asthma history, so get a little dusty. I'm gonna start wheezing. Right. <laughs> one more thing: Would you do an autopsy on the loved one? No, I would not. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I would get a trusted coworker to do the autopsy or hopefully they won't Lord willing they won't need one because not everyone gets an autopsy it's mm. usually just if you're not under a doctor's care or you may have like a uh, recreational drug or alcohol history or something like not recreational an addiction mm. yeah so even if you've been clean for like 15 years they would still bring you in because Potentially, even if it was natural, it might have been exasperated by your drug use. Because most people don't like, like cocaine users, they don't usually die from an overdose per se. It's usually a heart, it's usually cardiac arrest. Right. Because it's a stimulant. So. Well, I thought everybody get an autopsy done. Hmm. Not everyone needs one. Um, if, if you're not under a doctor's care, if you like with decomposed cases, you not can't always tell if there's trauma or not. So they're gonna bring you in for an autopsy to make sure that there was no foul play. But if you have a primary care doctor that you've been seeing, you know, every year for your physical, or if you do have any physical ailments and they've been monitoring them and you pass away, they can sign your death certificate. You don't need an autopsy. Mm. Well, I think this was very informative. I definitely learned a lot. <laughs> thank you um to the listeners if you have any questions comments or concerns or if you want to say hey girl hey please email me at hello at the phdpodcast.com and until next time everyone later later